Hi, Phil. Welcome to the show. I um, really appreciate you taking your time out of your day to uh, talk with us and, and, and teach our audience about your methods and what you've learned uh, in your career. And um, to get started, I'd like to give our audience who may not know who you are a little bit of background about um, your, your running background as well as your training principles. Good to be with you, Jeff. Um, it's my pleasure. Um, I, I ran track and field in high school and college, and um, I was always a sprinter. And they tried me to do, tried to get me to do uh, long distance, like the quarter mile, uh, <laughs> and uh, and I just didn't didn't want to, I didn't want to run that far. I was real good at running hundred and two hundred or hundred hundred yards back then, and two hundred and twenty yards, um, and the relay, and um, and it was it was great. And when I uh, uh, graduated college, uh, eventually, uh, after many years, too many years. Um, I uh, started jogging uh, because I wanted to get back into shape. Um, I was in school for many, many years, and it just beat me up physically and um, mentally. And I wanted to get back into shape, and I started jogging. And one day I was watching the Boston Marathon on, on the local TV, um, and and I thought, well, gee, that's, that's interesting. Um, maybe I'll run a marathon and the New York City Marathon was six months away and I thought that's plenty of time <laughs> and, uh, so I, I, I trained I ran the marathon I finished and uh, and I kept going from that point and at that at that stage I had been in practice um, just for a, a couple of years I think and um, started seeing a lot of runners with injuries and oh, can we can we step, take a step back you said you're, you've been in practice you're a doctor correct just to make our, make our yes, audience aware? I'm no longer in practice, uh, but I was in practice, and I used a variety of therapies from biofeedback and manipulation to diet and nutrition, and, of course, coaching became a very big issue. And the reason it became a big issue was because I started seeing mostly runners, and I was in the New York City area, so in, in 1977, uh, when I went into practice, yeah, 77, the running boom was really starting to, to swell and uh, the New York City, uh, the New York Roadrunners Club spawned a lot of um, running clubs in the surrounding communities and ours was no exception and I was involved with that. And um, So all of a sudden I started seeing a lot of runners with injuries, all kinds of injuries, and I would... Um, treat them and many of them were easy to correct fortunately and but then I noticed they would come back either with the same injury or a new injury and it didn't take long to realize that what they were doing in their training was interfering really with what I was doing mm -hmm. my treatment and as a new practitioner I didn't mind people coming back to see me uh, frequently because they were injured or re-injured but after a while I realized this is um, you know, this is not what healthcare is all about. My job is really to, to work myself out of a job by teaching the, the patient, the runner in this case, how to, be, how to be healthy. And I realized the only way to do that was to ask them about coaching or ask them about their training. And I realized that since most of them didn't have coaches, I needed to play that role as well. And I started, I started doing that. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. So your kind of your coaching background came more from uh, your medical practice and realizing that there was this need for people to to realize what good training would be, so they can stay injury free, as opposed to coming from a background where maybe traditionally someone goes to school for exercise physiology or um, you know those types of those types of avenues and 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 um, and going that way. And I think actually that's probably a big reason why your method is has worked so well to keep people injury free. Um, so let's talk a little bit about you know what the what the basics principles that that you espouse are and and kind of how they came about. Well, I think um, when I ran that New York City Marathon, um, it was uh, it was uh, torture. It was you know of course I, I had trained for six months from 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 zero running and um, I didn't get hurt, um, but it was just not enough training and. My goal was to run this marathon, and it, it was sort of as a way to, to kind of, in a sense, prove my health. Um, and I remember crossing the finish line and uh, being taken away uh, to the medical tent. 
and um, kind of passing out and then waking up a little while later and kind of looking around seeing all these runners in pain, uh, groaning and moaning and ambulances coming and going, doctors running around. And I, and I thought, well, I did this for my health, but this doesn't look like a very healthy place. <laughs> um, and I realized um, one of the important lessons of my, my career, which was being healthy and being fit are two very different things. And I didn't really get healthy. All I did was get fit enough to run a marathon. And that became um, a, a very important philosophy for me and an important um, lesson to pass on to my patients. And my, my goal was to help the patient be a healthy and fit runner. And so my philosophy has been, and still today as much as it was back then, to not do anything in training or racing that's not going to also be health promoting. And the, and the bottom line here is that we have so many runners who are fit, fit enough to run a 10K, fit enough to run a sub-40 10K or sub-30 10K, fit enough to run a marathon, but they're not healthy. Mm -hmm. they're not healthy because they're injured, they're sick, um, unfortunately some of them are dying, um, and you know, just, just you know, people, people relate to that so well because most runners get injured. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree 100%. And I think for most runners, even if you're a beginner, you know, you can really appreciate that because I think so many runners start out wanting to run, you know, beginner runners start out because they want to get healthier. But along those lines, they don't realize that getting fitter for it, like if their goal is to run, go from zero to training for a marathon, that's not necessarily going to make them healthier. You, definitely, they're going to get fitter, but they're not going to get healthier. And I think that's a great point that you're able to, to distinguish between those two uh, for the beginner runner. And then also for the advanced runner who may say, well, I can run a marathon in sub three hours or I can qualify for Boston. I must be very fit. I can eat whatever I want or I can do all these things. And they then don't necessarily realize that being able to, to run really fast doesn't necessarily mean that you're a healthy individual. So I think that's a fantastic philosophy for both sides of the equation. Yeah, I, I knew I knew a, a more than a few couch potatoes when I was in practice. Patients who came in and said, "I, you know, I've got to get, I've got to get back in shape," um, and I would encourage them to start doing something, and they would, and and I'd see them maybe a year later or two years later, and 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 I would say, you know, you were healthier when you were a couch potato because they would just run themselves into the ground, and. It's, it's sad, the priority in the running community, and it's not different than, than any other sport. And I've, I've worked in virtually every sport. I, was, I trained racehorses for a while as well. That was a lot of fun. But I've worked in all sports, and the, the philosophy, the, the, the focus by all the athletes in all the sports is really the same thing. It's that I need to train, and I need to get better. I mean, and they often forget that there's this health factor which is actually going to keep them going and actually make them more fit and make them a better athlete for a longer period of time. So very, very important. Absolutely. Um, so let's talk with, you know, let's start if, let's say we're a beginner runner um, coming to you and, and saying, you know, I want to get, I want to run this race. I want to get fitter. Um, how, how do you approach that from a training perspective? What kind of um, principles do you tell them to abide by when they're doing training to, to be able to do increase both their fitness and their health at the same time and, and make sure they stay injury free? Well, there's a, there's a lot of things. One is I try to get them to understand about intuition and instincts mm -hmm. because every animal on earth knows how to eat except human. Every animal on earth knows how to run fast and run slow and monitor themselves from a fitness standpoint except for humans we've lost that instinct and a lot of it has to do with um, marketing of products and the no pain no gain society and that sort of thing um, so I try and encourage them to, to to pay attention to their body mm -hmm. every little thing every little twinge every little ache every little feeling every little um, <clears throat> afternoon fatigue or post meal uh, sleepiness, every little sign and symptom has meaning. And for me, in practice, m one of my important goals was to assess a runner if they're injured or not. Was you know assessing them meant asking them about their little aches and pains, and asking them about you know what does their energy do after a meal, what does it do before a meal, 
uh, do you get to sleep quickly and stay asleep or do you wake up at 2 a.m. And all these things are very meaningful and I try to encourage patients to um, think the same way. What does this mean? It all has meaning. Um, but what I developed very quickly in practice, I think by, the, by 1980, I was using um, something that I had uh, written a paper on in college in, in um, uh, somewhere along the way on biofeedback. And what we were doing was measuring the individual the subjects, the test subjects, and we were exposing them to various stresses, running in place, riding a bike, showing them really ugly pictures, uh, showing them uh, sexy pictures, and, and then we were monitoring things. We were monitoring many things, including the heart rate. And I realized how quickly the heart rate goes up and down based on um, external stimulus. And in 1980, there were no, there were 79, I guess, there were really uh, very few heart um, monitoring devices. But there was a cardiac uh, monitor that was used in hospitals, and I got one. It was a big, it looked like a crossing guard outfit. <laughs> kind of went across the chest, and then another strap went over your shoulder, and had this big box that strapped into the strap, and you had to kind of look down your shirt to see the, the heart rate. Um, and I started testing people uh, in my office, and then by then I was going out to the track every um, week or twice a week with a group of athletes to watch them, to evaluate their gait and other things. And, um, and then I started accumulating heart rates and realizing that there is a relationship between heart rate and changes in gait. For example, if your heart rate goes up too fast or if it goes up too high, your gait will become more irregular. To make a long story short, I developed a formula called the 180 formula, mm -hmm. and and that formula, um, which I think by 1983 was pretty well set, has kind of stood the test of time, and um, I've since correlated it with uh, oxygen uptake, respiratory quotient, and lactate levels, um, brain waves, a lot of different things. Um, uh, in addition to treating patients and helping people perform better, I have this researcher's mentality and I like to measure things. So I would always measure stuff. And I probably spent twice as much time with every patient I saw because I liked measuring things. So I would keep, you know, and I would keep records and uh, crunch data and all that kind of stuff. So the heart monitor became a, a very important biofeedback device for me when I was working one-on-one -on -one with, with this runner. And then it wasn't until, I think, 1983 that Polar uh, developed the wireless heart monitor, and they were available to everybody. Up until then, you know, patients would, I would buy two or three of these monitors and always have them available. Mm -hmm. Runners would come by and bar them and go to the track, which was only a mile away. Mm -hmm. and, and then they'd come back after they work out and drop the monitor off. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, things have changed, but... Um, the heart monitor um, became a very important biofeedback device. And what I wanted patients to do, what I wanted runners to do, was to understand how they felt at a heart rate of 70 and a heart rate of 80. And as they ran faster and their heart rate got to 90 and 100 and 120 and 150 and 180, how did they feel? And I wanted them to relate uh, to that. And, and um, I got to the point where I was encouraging you know we would have contests and i would always win we'd, we'd say let's let's see who could run at a 142 heart rate and uh we'd take turns with the monitor and um and people learned how to do that eventually and but it, it was a it was probably the best um uh a, the best way to determine uh, a very important function which is how can you burn more fat mm -hmm. the concept of fat burning is very simple. We we have we have two basic forms of energy: sugar and fat. We burn both all the time, most of the time, and we do burn some protein for energy, but that's a whole other story, and not more the exception than the rule. But we burn fat and sugar for energy. Sitting here right now, we're both burning 
a certain mix of fat and sugar. Mm -hmm. The question is, how much fat and sugar are you burning? How much am I burning? Correct. Uh, I know how much I'm burning because I've measured it. <laughs> I can actually tell um, in the course of a day, and if I have a stressful day, I know I'm, I'm going to start burning less fat and I could feel it. Mm -hmm. But runners who burn more fat in the course of the day and night, because we burn fat and sugar all night long as well, um, and those who burn higher amounts of fat during running are generally more fit and more healthy. Interesting. Um, so before we, we continue, because there's a lot of great points there that I want to follow up on, um, you mentioned you know your method of one, the 180 method. Um, can you explain a little bit about you know what that is, how people can calculate it, and we'll we'll put it on our website so people can have the actual numbers. But um, I'd like to to have you explain it in your own words for people that have, may have heard it before but have heard it wrong or or mis have a misconception about it. And you know again um, we we touched on this before we we went on, but the um, the um, the rumors I hear about what the 180 formula is. Are, are sometimes funny. Um, uh, please look at the formula and, and you know calculate it properly. But what I did in the beginning was I realized that there was this certain level of intensity where a runner's gait would change um, for the worse, um, uh, aches and pains would come on, recovery would be slower, and so on and so forth. And I thought, well, okay, that means we want to determine what's the best heart rate for the runner to train at so that not only they could, they could burn more fat for energy, but they would not have a distorted gait, they would not develop muscle imbalance, they, would, um, they wouldn't get injured, they would actually correct injuries. Um, and that process would, in, a, in a new runner that I saw for the first time would sometimes take me two hours. Uh, from an assessment standpoint. And once we determined it, uh, the runner would go off and train, and I'd see him or her a couple of weeks later, and they'd be training at a particular heart rate, and I would evaluate them, and I would sometimes say, well, you're, you're going a little bit over, so we're going to cut your heart rate down. And this was a tedious thing. And I thought, well, gee, there must be a way to figure out a formula. Um, and I knew there was the VO2 max issue, and I never... Um, Never thought much of VO2 max uh, as, a, as a worthwhile assessment tool. But I knew about fat burning, and I, um, I also knew that we couldn't send people to an exercise. Back then, you had to go to an exercise physiology lab to have all that measured, and they just didn't, they weren't very popular. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I thought, well, there must be an easy way to do this on a formula would be the most logical. And I knew the 220 formula, uh, and I knew that it was not very accurate, and I, uh, there was nothing published about it. And, um, and so I started taking the, the, the runners that I had determined a heart rate with mm -hmm. that seemed to work fine, and I thought, how can, we, how can we extrapolate the data that we have for them and come up with a number? And... Um, and I, it took months, and one day, actually in the shower, um, I just sort of, I don't want to say I had a vision, because people think of me as, as being a little strange anyway, but I had a vision. <laughs> there was this 180. I was thinking of the 220 formula and wondering where they got that from, um, and they just pulled it out of nowhere. Um, and all of a sudden, out of somewhere else comes 180, and I thought, well, I can't use 180 because I've got all this data... And so I basically just crunched everything, and I ended up with 180, you subtract your age, and then, which doesn't have any meaning, 180 minus your age doesn't mean anything, uh, despite all the rumors. Uh, but then there are, there are different categories. You have to find the category that best matches your health and fitness level. So if you're a, beginning, a beginner runner, uh, or if you're in rehab for a, a heart condition or you had a hip replacement, um, if you're overweight and you're just getting on a, on a program of, of walking and jogging, uh, if you're already training and you're, but you're injured or you get too many colds every year, uh, if, you're, if you're competing and you're not injured, 
so on and so on. You find the category that you best fit into, mm-hmm. and then it'll tell you to uh, subtract 10 from the 180 minus the age, subtract 5, don't subtract anything, or add 5. There's four categories. And um, if you're honest, which is the hardest part of it, mm-hmm. you find the category that best matches you, and if you're not sure, you pick the one that uh, is most conservative, the one that gives you the lowest heart rate. Mm-hmm. Um, that becomes the harder. Now, if we compare the formula with the process of the tedious process of putting somebody on the treadmill, measuring their oxygen and carbon dioxide uh, levels, and doing all that stuff, and compare the results of the two, they often are within one or two beats of each other, um, and so they're surprisingly accurate. And yeah, it took me a couple of years to figure that out, and I was quite confident and. Um, and what what I then had to do was um, learn that whether you're swimming or biking or running, that 180 heart rate, that what I call the maximum aerobic training heart rate, is the same. What's different is your perceived exertion. Mm-hmm. So if you're training, if your um, if your maximum aerobic training heart rate is 150, let's say. Um, then running at 150 is going to feel kind of easy. Biking at 150 is going to feel kind of easy, but a little bit more um, effort is going to be required because you're you're not using as much muscle mass when you're on the bike. You have a coasting factor. Your stress level, literally stress levels are lower. When you're in the pool, boy, you don't have much gravity effect on you at all, so there's hardly any stress on you. And now to get to a 150 heart rate, you have to work really hard. Mm-hmm. Now that makes a lot of sense. Factors that kind of fell into place in the in the years after that 180 formula, which I think came about in 1983. Mm-hmm. So now that runners have this 180 formula, let's say they're they're honest with themselves, which is which is really hard to do because I know runners. I work with them all the time, and they will always say, well, I'm, I'm a tough guy, I'm fit, and, and always choose the higher number. But let's just assume that somebody's really honest with themselves and they've, they've picked the right number. So that now correlates to their easy running pace, correct? That correlates with the highest heart rate they should be training in order to do several things. One is to burn more body fat. Now, if they burn more body fat, they're going to get thinner because their body's not going to need to hold as much fat. And I'll tell you, one thing I've noticed um, through the years, through the decades, is that going to races um, has become um, a bit sad because I have seen a continuous change in the body images of not just runners, but swimmers and uh, swimmers and bikers, triathletes, uh, race car drivers, hockey players, you know, everybody. Body fat content is going up and people are getting much too big. Mm-hmm. And that's a problem. But at this training heart rate of whatever it is, 150, um, they will learn, their, their metabolism will learn to burn more body fat for energy, which will allow them to go faster over time. So, mm-hmm. yeah, they're going to complain that they're going too slow at their maximum aerobic heart rate. But what happens is, as the months go by, at some point, they start complaining they have to go too fast at the same heart rate. And uh, I can give you a lot of case histories and a lot of examples of individuals, but probably the, the, my most favorite athlete that I ever worked with was Mark Allen, uh, who, who won six Ironman championships and uh, was a sub-30-minute 10K runner. I mean, Mark... Mark uh, was very disciplined, and that was his strength. And he was very disciplined with his, his training and the heart monitor. And when I first started working with him at a, a 155 heart rate, Mark was able to run 820 on a track. And I remember running around the track with him, and he had that monitor you had to look down your shirt at. <laughs> and, you know, he kept saying, this is pretty slow. I said, yeah. Uh, but but it'll get faster, and I said this is this is the rate you have to go. And he said I'm not sure I'm not sure I could do this. And I realized what he was saying. It, this was San Diego in 1983. 
the mecca of um, the new sport of triathlon, the mecca of endurance athletes. How could how could somebody go out and run at an 820 pace when there's all these speedsters running by you? I said, well, Mark, you could train at night and nobody will see you. <laughs> he laughed. And, but he called me the next morning um, and said, uh, you know, I went for a run in the hills this morning and my average pace was closer to nine-minute pace. I said, oh, that's not surprising. You have to slow down when you go up a hill. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it wasn't too many years later that Mark started complaining about having to go too fast because at the same heart rate, he was now going seven minutes a mile, and then he started going six, 30 minutes a mile, then he started going six minutes a mile. And he, he broke five, or he broke, uh, I think he got down to 510 pace. Wow. Or 515 pace. At the same heart rate, what's the difference? burning more fat, in addition to building more aerobic muscles and, you know, staying healthy and continuing to, to improve on, on fitness levels. And uh, there's dietary factors, there's all kinds of things, but that's the big difference. Right. No, and I mean, I think there's, I mean, there's so much to pull out of that. And I think obviously the, the, the big issue is it goes back to when, when runners look to improve when they're using your method. Um, it's not so much that their their heart rate is going to change. They actually want to stay at that same maximum aerobic heart rate, but it's going to continue to get easier and easier and easier. And for most people who are training for the marathon or even the half marathon, where that makes a lot of sense is that marathon pace. Let's say you know roughly your your marathon pace is going to be that top end aerobic kind of pace. Is that that marathon pace is going to come down and down and down, and that's ultimately how you get faster. Exactly. Exactly. And, and for those who, who may not know, and, and I know this, but and you do probably do as well, when you talk about burning fat and sugars, um, where that really comes into play for the marathon is your ability to, to burn fat as a fuel source, which is critical in the marathon because you can only store so many carbohydrates in the body, usually a little bit under two hours worth of carbohydrates. And for almost er for everybody, actually, they can't run a marathon under two hours. Um, and so what you need, what really this method is doing is teaching you to run faster while burning fat as a fuel source. Exactly, and it's really doing it's really doing a very important thing, and it's teaching you to build your aerobic system. Mm -hmm. we, we forget about the aerobic system. We learn about the digestive system and the nervous system and the muscle system, but there's this aerobic system in the body that incorporates the aerobic muscle fibers, which are mm -hmm. called slow twitch fibers for a reason because they make you run slow. Mm -hmm. But for Mark Allen, 5.15 was slow, mm -hmm. and for the many people who were able to run under 5.30 or under 6 minutes or under 7 minutes, that's still slow. And when you look at how, how much of, when we look at, we look at fat and sugar burning, but a marathon is an aerobic event. Mm -hmm. we, we generate, we rely on 98% of our uh, aerobic energy for a marathon. In a 10K, it's about 95%. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, why are all these runners spending all this time training above that aerobic level or training anaerobically, which is quite often what they're doing every day, mm -hmm. um, when the races from a 10K to a marathon and beyond are 95 98% aerobic? No, absolutely. I mean, that's it's we've definitely, you know, I've written a lot of articles on that exact topic and, and looked at those charts of, you know, the paces or sorry, the percentage of aerobic to anaerobic contribution of distance events and, and those types of things. And, and it's so true. And the aerobic system becomes so important in developing it, just like like you're talking about, is, is absolutely critical. Um, you know, one of the questions that I had and, and I kind of posed to you beforehand was, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the athletes that I work with that they really struggle, and I know I did as well when I was when I was running, is that concept that running easier is building your aerobic system better than than running faster most of the time if you're if you're at that level. Um, how do you work with athletes, or how did you work with athletes who really had a hard time believing that? they were actually getting fitter aerobically even though they were running slower because that's a really hard concept to to really uh, to grasp it is a hard concept um, especially in our society uh, we're no pain no gain we want results overnight uh, we're willing to take drugs to get results overnight um, and it, it's difficult so there's there's two kinds of patients there's the patient who 
either comes to see me um, or came to see me because their friend got faster. Um, and so they believed what I was doing um, uh, or they were desperate enough to believe in, in, in me. Or they came to see me and they had some physical ailment. And that's how I saw Mark Allen. Mm -hmm. I was doing a workshop in um, San Diego where I would t work with 10 or 12 athletes over a three-day period. And, um, and Mark was one of them. And, um, and he wasn't able to run. He had an injury, a calf injury. And, and I kind of saw him during the, during the, the lectures, the lecture part of the, the workshop. And he, you know, he, I, I, I kind of, I mean, I love Mark. I still love Mark, but it, hopefully he won't hear this. But he was, I knew what he was thinking. Like, what is this guy talking about? He wants us to run slower. Mm -hmm. um, well, Mark had an injury and I was fortunately able to correct it right away. He was able to run the next day okay. Um, and he was able to race the following weekend in Hawaii at a small triathlon. Um, I said, sure, you, you'll be able to race. Uh, he was not, not only able to race, um, but he didn't feel any pain and he won the race. So he was ready to listen to anything I told him at that point. Mm -hmm. So that's the other type of person is, um, you know, they come to me because they're injured and, and they find out that I know what I'm doing with injuries, so maybe I know what I'm doing with this other weird idea, these strange heart monitors, which are not strange anymore. Everybody has them now. Right. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the big question, I think, is, is always, how long is it going to take me to get faster? Right. That was my next question, so I'm glad you, you worked right into it. <laughs> yeah. Um, the answer is... How long is it going to take you to get rid of all the things in your life that are interfering with your health and fitness? And that's a big issue. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not eating well, you're not going to get faster uh, all that quick. Uh, you may never get faster. Um, I had, a, I had a, a patient who did really well. She was able to go from, I don't know, just under a 10-minute mile pace at her aerobic heart rate to about eight minutes over a period of a, um, a year maybe. Um, and then she kind of got stuck there and she came in one, one day and said, I'm kind of stuck at eight minutes, what should I do? So we went through her diet, we went through um, uh, her stresses, we, we went through her training and everything else and um, she happened to mention her mother being diabetic, I said, well, is there any other diabetes in your family? Oh, yeah, my father. Hmm. And then I realized that this, this woman, who was only 28 or 29 years of age, was very sensitive to carbohydrates. So the amount of carbohydrates she was eating was way too much for her. Unknown to me, she wasn't getting any symptoms, but it was a subtle thing. And I said, let's try um, reducing the carbohydrates even more. Mm -hmm. She did. And... And in, in a two-week period, she went from eight minutes, she'd lost almost, she took a, almost a minute off her, her time, wow. her track time at, at that aerobic heart rate. So she went from about an eight-minute pace to about a seven-minute pace. That's a, an extreme example, but those things occur. So the question is, how, how healthy are you? And, and, and is your stress level real high? Are you eating really bad? Are you skipping meals? Are you not sleeping? Uh, are you cheating on your heart rate? Are you going out um, Sunday without your monitor because the gang goes out for a long run and, you know, you're a runner, you got to do the same thing. And, um, so you're out there running uh, 15 or 20 beats higher than you should be. And once a week, how significant is that? Probably very significant for the average runner. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I think, I think that's a great point. Yeah, definitely. Um, going back to almost maybe the start of the conversation when you talked a lot about the biofeedback and um, you know what that implies for the athlete and learning how to feel those types of things. Um, one of the struggles that I've always had as a coach is I'll tell an athlete to run easy and their immediate response is, well, what pace, what pace is that? Um, and I always think to myself, well, it's easy. You know, you, you go out and, and you run and if it feels easy, then that's, that's easy. Um, 
you know, how, how have you worked with athletes with that biofeedback and kind of teaching them more how to, to go back to that point you talked about with how to learn that instinct? You know, what's that instinct of feeling like, okay, I'm running easy and that's what easy is and not necessarily needing to push. Have you found any good strategies to work with athletes that way? Well, I, I've attempted to, to do that many different ways. And, uh, um, you know, some people have it. Some people, I grew up in the 60s. I studied um, Zen Buddhism and Eastern philosophy, and, and I got it back then. Um, in some cultures, uh, people grow up with that instinct. I worked with, with Greta Weitz for, for a few years, and when I first saw Greta, I had that old monitor where you had to look down the shirt, and um, she didn't speak very good English then. And she, she kind of, I said, you, you have to look down your shirt to see the... She kind of looked at me funny. But I said, run, run at your normal training pace. And I, I set the monitor to what I think her training pace should be. And she was dead on, mm -hmm. instinctually. She knew what her body should, should feel like. Um, a lot of times I would say to a person, when you're done an aerobic workout, whether it's long or short, you should feel like you haven't done anything. You should feel like you can turn around and do the same workout again. Not that you want to, but you should feel like you haven't done anything. And that's a pretty good way to, to relate to your body yeah. in terms of you know what an aerobic workout feels like. No, that's actually great, and I think a lot of people could use that just right off the bat, even if they don't have a heart rate monitor available after listening to this, to say, boom, if I could do this again, and not that I would want to, but if I could, that, that's perfect. Yeah, you shouldn't, your, your knee injury shouldn't be acting up. As a matter of fact, um, what I discovered was that running at that aerobic maximum heart rate or below, um, various muscle imbalances would would get corrected. The body corrects things. You know, we cut our finger. We don't have to run to the emergency room. We don't have to do anything. It heals itself. The body is always fixing things, and the body is always fixing muscle imbalances, which is the the cause of many, many physical injuries. Mm -hmm. And muscle imbalances, you can see in a runner, uh, and I spent so many hours on the track running back and forth um, to the middle of the straightaway to watch runners come down and and then turn around and watch their backside as they run away and watch them from a distance. And you can you can see the, you know, we all know what our friend looks like um, who's 300 yards down the road mm -hmm. because we know his gait. We don't see his face, but we know his gait, and they know our gait. And that's because their some total of muscle balance or imbalance usually is somewhat consistent, and so that that hip rotation, excess hip rotation, or that excess um, whatever that you have that's causing an injury um, should not get worse when you run it, actually should get better. So that's another good way. Little aches and pains you might have should go away during an aerobic, a true aerobic workout. No, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and actually kind of related, um, one of the things that I've heard from runners when they talk about you know using your method to run is that sometimes, especially when they start with kind of like Mark Allen, where they're like, "This is just too slow." And some athletes feel like it's almost they feel like it's too slow to physically run that slow. Um, how do you approach athletes who feel like they have that problem? I I just tell them uh, I'm very frank. Uh, this is the level of your fitness, mm -hmm. of your aerobic fitness. I don't care what your 10K time is. This is the level of your aerobic fitness. And if it's way down here and you want to become a better runner and you want to get healthy, you've got to bring your aerobic fitness up to a higher level. And it's really as simple as that. You know, people, people don't um, complain when they go for a VO2 max test and their, their numbers are terrible. They just don't tell anybody. <laughs> and then they, you know, then they go out and train hard anyway. Uh, even though they know they shouldn't, but it, it, it's it's um, it's it's a it's a a reality that people need to understand that your your fitness level is way way down there. It's bottomed out, mm -hmm. and it's the reason you're not getting better. It's the reason you're not getting healthier. It's the reason you're sick. It's the reason for all these problems that you have. And you know, I, I would always have runners come in and say. You know, why can't I be like so-and-so who never is injured and always runs well and, and um, keeps getting better? 
and I'd say, wait a minute, so-and-so is a patient of mine, and none of that is true. <laughs> so, um, you know, pay attention to yourself and, and, and focus on being both healthy and fit because it's, it's very important. You, you want to be running until the day you die, and you want to you wanna be, uh, you know, running well into your hundreds uh, and, not, and not drop dead in your 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s. That's unacceptable. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this is this is what it's all about. No, I think you know what? that's fantastic, and I think I, I think that is the overall encompassing theme of this interview and, and your training. And I think that's probably actually the perfect way to end, in in a sense. Um, I mean, because it, it really encapsulate, encapsulates it all. Um, but before we go, I want to you know ask you about a little bit about what you're doing now and how athletes can kind of find you and and some of the other things that you're doing. Because I know you're really into music, so. Well, they can't find me because I'm off the grid. <laughs> Actually, um, I, I do um, go around do, doing lectures. Um, we're, we're going on our fourth tour, but I've become a, a musician, as many people know. Um, I've got a, 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 a new album coming out in February, which will be the fifth album. And we do what's called a music and wellness tour, uh, Coralie and I. Coralie is a family physician uh, who's... Um, uh, we met uh, in 1997. She came to one of my seminars, and we've been working together ever since. So we do we do what's called a music and wellness seminar, where we play music. Uh, it depends on the situation. We we sometimes uh, we'll go to a sports club and they'll they'll have a, a dinner for us and we'll lecture and then play music, um, house concerts, all different types of things. But they can find me on my website, Um The just just to very important that people uh, don't read some of the old books that are out there. The Maffetone Method, which is a great title, I didn't come up with it, but mm-hmm. the publisher did, and it's a great title. It's still out there, but the book is, um, <clears throat> I think, it's thirteen years old now. Okay, and I. I, I I don't recommend it, I, and the publisher hates when I say that, but I don't recommend it. The, the new book is called The Big Book of Endurance Training and Racing. Okay. I almost okay. Forgot, forgot the title. <laughs> uh, and that, that details all the things we've talked about. Awesome. Uh, and those are, those are discussed on the website as well. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll throw up, uh, we're, for people that are listening to this podcast, we'll throw up those links on the website to your, to your website or, and also to the book so they can check it out because I think um, it's, it's it's a phenomenal read and, and definitely is um, should be on some everybody's list who's interested in training and learning more. Especially again, how it ta- how running can be that well-rounded balance between health and fitness. Um, so I definitely appreciate it, and obviously, hopefully, they, they check you out, um, check out some of your music as well, and, and and perhaps catch you on tour somewhere when you're when you're traveling around. Sure. Thanks so much, Jeff. No, thank you so much. I really appreciate it.